First reading comes from Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 to 9. These are, the, these are the commands, decrees and laws of the Lord your God, directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children after them, may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The New Testament reading is from Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he was travelling, came where the man was, and when he saw him, took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning again. Uh, before we get underway, just a reminder that after the sermon, when we come to our prayer time, uh, Mick is going to lead us in prayer, but he'll invite you to pray as well. Um, you can stay where you are, uh, just uh, pray from there. And our particular focus will be the mission roadmap, but of course you can pray for other things that are relevant to our church as well. Well, um, we're starting with a quiz this morning, and the theme is love songs. I want to see how well you know love songs. Okay, so uh, who made this song famous? And I will always love you, I will always love you. Whitney Houston. Yeah, any other names? Dolly Parton was the one, that was my next question. She was the one who wrote it and uh, first performed it. All right, uh, finish this line. All you need is? Love. 
of by yeah Lennon and McCartney and there we go and finally who wrote this line it's a love story baby just say yes sounds like frozen it's Taylor Swift yes well done we love love songs don't we it didn't take you long to figure out any of those and if you've been watching the news this week, maybe you can understand why we love love songs. Uh, it seems that what the world needs now is love. I promise I won't keep quoting love songs. Uh, but the news right now is full of mayhem and destruction. The Israel-Palestine conflict, Ukraine, close to the home, a teacher in an Anglican school in Sydney, murdered. Our world is a mess. And this morning, as we come to the end of our Mission Roadmap series, we'll be thinking about showing Jesus' love to the world. Our vision is to see lives transformed by Jesus in the Bay and Basin in ever-increasing numbers. We want to see lives changed. We want to see people come to know Jesus. We want to see people growing in maturity in Jesus. Our mission is to be a church where our love for God and one another overflows in love for the Bay and Basin community. And our vision and mission are good, but what does that look like on the ground? How do we do it? That's where our focus areas help us. And our first focus area we saw is gathering. We gather because we've been gathered by Jesus. And as we gather, we glorify God and we grow. That was our second focus area, growing. Uh, not just growing in number, uh, with more and more people coming to know Jesus, but also growing in depth, in maturity, growing in Christ-likeness. Focus area three we saw last week is sharing Jesus with the Bay and Basin, telling people all about Jesus so that they too can follow him. And finally today, our fourth focus area is showing the love of Jesus in our church community and in our wider community. So let me pray as we open God's word together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Amen. It seems like the media is always looking for a gotcha moment. We see it mostly with politicians, uh, some journalists trying to catch them out, make them slip up. Uh, it's the same with celebrities. Uh, now, don't judge me, but I've been watching the Taylor Swift documentary on Netflix. Uh, it's fascinating. Taylor Swift may not be your cup of tea. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time listening to her music, but she's a cultural phenomenon. It's very interesting. And she makes an interesting comment at one point in the documentary uh, she's starting to deal with the impact of fame and learning about the difficulties of dealing with the media and she says she's actually afraid to say anything of substance for fear that the media or even the public will judge her. Now that didn't start with Taylor Swift of course. The media have always been looking for that gotcha moment. Well in Luke's Gospel we meet a man who's looking for a gotcha moment. He's trying to trap Jesus. He's trying to catch him out. Luke 10, verse 25, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, this man is trying to test Jesus. He's trying to catch him out. But Jesus responds by pointing the man back to the Jewish law. This man's an expert in the Jewish law. So this is safe territory for him. Jesus says to him, verse 26, what is written in the law? And so the man answers, verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus commends the man for his answer. But the man pushes further because he wants to justify himself. And he asks Jesus a very pointed question. He says, who is my neighbour? He knows the law. He knows that he's supposed to love his neighbour. 
And he wants to define that as narrowly as possible. And so Jesus tells a story in response. We know the story well, don't we? The parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's worth noticing, we know the story, and so if we hear the word Samaritan, we think, good. But for the Jewish people, if they heard Samaritan, they thought, bad. The Jewish people hated Samaritans. So Jesus tells this story, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And the first person to come to the scene is a priest, a religious leader, and he walks by. Uh, Next to come along is a Levite. He's a member of the special religious elite and he too passes by on the other side. Next comes a Samaritan. And he takes pity on the man. Verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And he gives the innkeeper some money and makes sure that all of the expenses are covered. And so now Jesus asks his own pointed question. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law answers, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. It's a powerful story that challenges our assumptions about who we are to love. A story is one thing, of course. Uh, But Jesus actually lives it out. He lives a life of radical love. He gives his life not just for a neighbour, but for his enemy. Romans 5 verse 6 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It wasn't when we were his friends that Christ died for us. He died for us when we were ungodly, when we were undeserving when we were against him. But, Romans 5 verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What amazing love that is. The Good Samaritan shows sacrificial love for a man who was his enemy. Jesus gave his life on the cross for us while we were still his enemies. Jesus' death challenges our assumptions about who we are to love. Christians are sometimes criticised for being too exclusive, for believing that Jesus is the only way to God. One writer put it like this. He said, To suggest that one out of 4,200 religions holds all of the truth and the key to salvation is not only arrogant, it is spiritually narcissistic. The accusation is fair to a point. He's understood the exclusive claims of Christianity. But that's not our invention. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' claims are exclusive. But at the same time, Christianity is radically inclusive. Jesus came for anyone, for everyone. Anyone who will come to him and trust in him. And the inclusive nature of Christianity is there right from the beginning. Let's look together at Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus has died and he's risen again, and he's about to ascend to his Father's right hand, and he says this to his disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, their job is to make disciples of all nations. God's blessing is no longer focused just on Israel, his chosen people. Instead, God's blessing is focused on Jesus and all who will come to him. Everyone who comes to Jesus, no matter who they are, No matter their nationality, their language, their status in society, 
everyone who comes to Jesus can be his disciple. Faith in Jesus is radically inclusive. And as we look forward, the picture we have of heaven is a community gathered around Jesus. And there will be no barrier, no excluding anyone based on nationality or language or anything else. Listen to the picture of the heavenly gathering in Revelation 7. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Our mission as a church comes straight out of God's mission heart. Our mission as a church uh, is to be a church where our love for God and one another overflows in love for the Bay and Basin community. It's because God has reached out to us in love that we reach out to others in love. Christ died for the ungodly. While we were his enemies, Christ died to bring us to God. And he left us with a job. Love God, love your neighbour. We don't only love those who love us, we love everyone. Imagine a church where we love God and we love one another so deeply that our love overflows to the Bay and Basin community. Imagine a church where the people in the community see the way we love one another, sacrificially. Imagine a church that is known for loving our community, practically, deeply. What would it look like to be a church marked by overflowing love? Well, first, being a church marked by overflowing love will mean both sharing Jesus and showing Jesus' love. Our deepest need as humans is for God's transforming love in Jesus. Our deepest need is forgiveness. And so we share Jesus. We invite people to trust in Jesus for salvation. But people have other needs as well. People have needs because they are human beings. And so we value them as human beings when we try to meet their needs as we're able. They might need financial assistance. They might need help with difficult family relationships. Or maybe they just need a friend. People come to us as a package. They have eternal needs, the need for forgiveness, to be right with God, but they also have needs here and now. And we love people well when we recognise both needs. Overflowing with love means both sharing Jesus and showing Jesus' love in practical ways. Second, being a church marked by overflowing love will mean sacrifice. And in this, we follow Jesus. Jesus, out of love, died in place of his enemies. He made the ultimate sacrifice. Love is costly. And for us, loving one another, loving our community, will be costly. It'll cost us time. It will cost us effort. And sometimes it will mean sacrificing our own preferences for the sake of others. Putting others first is in the character of our church. Now, this is a church that's built on putting others first. We stand on the shoulders of previous generations of church members, those who uh, raised funds and built, first at Huskisson, uh, then more recently at Sanctuary Point. And now, just as they build, we're about to embark on a building project. Uh, in a few minutes, I've got a little update for you on that. But the building project itself is an example of putting first the needs of others. The way it was explained to me when I started here was that the church building at Husky just wasn't big enough anymore. 
especially in peak holiday times, the regulars would hang back and allow visitors to find seats in the church and then try to squeeze in round the edges. And so putting others first is the whole reason for the church building project. The impetus for selling two church sites, buying a new block of land and, and starting an ambitious building project, it's all about putting others first. Let's continue to be a church that puts others first. A church that's prepared to make sacrifices for the sake of others. A church that's prepared to leave our own preferences to one side if it means sharing Jesus with more people, showing Jesus' love to more people. Finally, being a church marked by overflowing love will mean valuing every person. When our family first started here, it was a huge encouragement to me to see that you already had in place a pastoral care team. Because that said to me that you value pastoral care, that you want to see every member well cared for. And it's been such a joy um, meeting with Deborah and partnering with the pastoral care team. They really do an excellent job. And our pastoral care team shows that our heart as a church is to value every person. Alongside the pastoral care team, there's been the care from growth groups. Not everyone can be in a growth group for health reasons or other reasons. Uh, and if you can't be in a growth group, we still want you to be cared for. And that's where the pastoral care team comes in. But of course, there's always been care within growth groups. Care within growth groups might be an unspoken assumption, but it's worth being clear about it. The primary place for care is in growth groups. The primary place for care is in growth groups because we value every member ministry. Every one of us has a role to play in the church and every one of us can play a part in caring for one another. Some will have more capacity than others, but we all have a role to play. A couple of weeks ago, Doug Horwood spoke to us about growth groups, and we spent some time in the service completing the growth group survey. And the good news is a number of people have expressed interest in joining a group. In fact, we had so many people interested that Doug and I are now talking about whether we need to start a new group or new groups. Growth groups are a great place to be cared for and to care for one another. Growth groups help us value every member. What does it look like for us to be a church that shows Jesus' love? There are lots of details we can work out together. But being a loving church means at least this. It means sharing and showing Jesus' love. It means sacrifice, and it means valuing every person. We live in a complex and troubled world. It's a bit simplistic to say all you need is love, and yet love is at the heart of God's plans for the world. And love is at the heart of God's purposes for his church. We're a church that shows the love of Jesus, because Jesus has shown his love to us. He died for us while we were his enemies. And so we love one another and we love our community because God has loved us. That's what drives us. Love God, love your neighbour. Imagine a church where we love God and we love one another so deeply that our love overflows to the Bay and Basin community. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus. Thank you that while we were still your enemies, Christ died for us. Help us to love as we have been loved. Amen.